So today's text is one of those texts that if you just read really quickly over it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. When I go to heaven, there's a place for me. God loves me. Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And yeah, something at the end there, right? It's one of those that if you read it really quickly, it seems really simple. But the second you slow down and like read all the lines and like think along it as you're reading it, it gets really confusing really fast right? Because the first part is this entire little discussion about, like, there are places in heaven where you can go, right? I think most of us sort of get that. And I have prepared a place for you. Then you have the second section where you have this discussion over, I'm the Father, and the Father's in me, and I am in him, and I do the works of him. And so if you've met me, you've met him. And if you've met him, you've met me. And we all go, oh my goodness, that's very circular, right? And then you have this third section in which you have this whole discussion over you will do greater things than me if you have faith, which is a really weird thing for Jesus to say when you start thinking through the implications of that, right? So what we're going to do today is I'm going to go through each one of these parts and sort of break it down because there's a lot of rabbit holes that if you just look at one of these parts, you can easily end up going down and missing the point of the whole thing, okay? So let's start here at the beginning. The beginning of the discussion is something we actually read um, very often at funerals, right? You hear this at funerals probably more often than um, anywhere else, right? This, you know, I go before you and I have set many houses. Now, one of the ways our evangelical and non-denominational brethren have gone down a rabbit hole is to get into a huge argument of how to interpret the Greek here. Is it a house or is it a mansion? Right? And if you go to certain evangelical groups, you can look them up online, they'll be like, you get a mansion, and you get a mansion, and you get a mansion. And I say, and you've totally missed the entire point of this if you're sitting down like an Oprah Winfrey giveaway of mansions and think that's how God works. The Greek is most, by the way, properly interpreted as abode or home. But if we think about it, abode or home would go ahead and imply not just a building, Right? Because, like, I've lived in a lot of places, and some of those places I lived were definitely home. And some of those places were temporary apartments. And there's a real different feeling when you come home to the people you love and the people you know, and you have arrived at home, and when you've arrived at your temporary apartment. Right? And I think key to this is God is saying, I have gone and prepared a home for you. Not a house, not a mansion, not a building. A home. Something far harder to find. Something far more beautiful than any building. A place where you and those you love gather in love. People may like their building, may not like their building that they live in. People may long to go back to a given building you've lived in or not. Well, some people miss buildings and some people don't. Everyone misses home. Right? There's a reason it's called homesick, not building sick. Because we all long for that moment where we are with those we love. And today, God reminds us part of the promise that is fulfilled at Easter is that we all have a home with him and those we love that is prepared for us for when we die. Not just to abide with God, but abide at home. That's the first part of the promise. Then we get to this sort of weird discussion over the Father and me and me and the Father, and if you've met me, you've met the Father, and if you've met the Father, you've met me, and you meet me, you meet the Father through me, and all that fun, right? So what Jesus is trying to get at in that, um, often, again, our evangelical and non-denominational brethren will go off into some sort of exclusionary, well, you need to meet Jesus, whatever, however they define that, or you have not been saved, right? Like they go down that road. I don't think Jesus is trying to go down that road at all because he never actually mentions salvation. He never mentions anything along that line, and that sort of interpretation ignores this whole, I have prepared a home for y'all, right? And so what I think he's really getting at is the Trinity 
at first. I think he's got sort of two points in here. The first one is sort of Trinitarian formula. Those of you who know your Trinitarian formula know that you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? Okay. And we believe in one God in three forms. We're all having nightmares of our confirmation class now, right? Okay. Now just follow me because there's a point to all this. Part of what he's reminding you is if you've met the Son, you've also met the Father, for they are one. Okay? And of course, if you meet the Father, you've also met the Son because they abide in each other. This seems very theoretical and very much in our brain, and you're all probably wondering, why is he talking about this? This is why. Because where we are headed after Easter is Pentecost. Okay? And one thing I have heard from many Christians is some sort of statement that goes, man, I just wish I could have been there and met Jesus. I mean, it's the number one thing that all politicians say. Like, if you ask them, if you go to any historical character and meet them, they all say, Jesus, right? And a lot of people long for that and say, I wish I could be as close to God as Thomas was, to put my hand in his put my finger in his hand, my arm in and a hand in his side, right? But here's the thing Jesus is reminding us of. We live in a post-Pentecost world. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, has been sent to all of us. Therefore, if you know the Father because you know the Son, if you know the Spirit, you know the Son. You know the Spirit, you know the Father. The reality is that we here today can experience and know God in as fundamental and life-changing as those apostles on that day with Christ. For if we know the Spirit, we know the Father. If they know the Son, they know the Father. You follow? And that is another promise of that God is with us. Maybe not in the same part of the Trinity, but just as fanatically, just as close, just as amazingly today as he was on that day he said that. God just abides with us via the Spirit rather than Jesus. But they are one and the same, so alas. We get to that third part. The one that I think a lot of people, if they're going to get caught on anything, get caught on this whole, like, so if I have faith, I'm going to do miracles greater than Jesus. I've looked at my scorecard. I'm currently behind. I currently have scored, oh, yeah, zero points. Right? And this can lead people to real distress and real despair, but to go there is to, I think, completely miss where, what he's talking about. Okay? It is not saying, you, Maria, will go ahead and resurrect someone. And if you don't, hmm. Okay, that's not what it's saying, okay? What God, what Jesus is saying is when I pass, when I go back and I ascend back to heaven, you, with the power of the advocate, and, it, and the, the one thing that I do love about Southern language is we have a plural, a y'all, and we have all y'all, Okay, which there's no mid-Atlantic equivalent. Maybe you guys um, is the closest we get. Okay, here's the thing. I think that is what Jesus is getting at. Is that if you look at the healing, he can heal however many he heals when he's there physically. He can feed however many he feeds while he's there physically. He can go ahead and do that, but because he is limited insofar as he is a person in a time, okay, we humanity, empowered by the advocate, who, by the way, is also the son and also the father, because we do not need to worry about death, the devil, and sin, because that has been defeated, God has a home for us, can spend our time doing what Christ did, freeing the prisoners, feeding the hungry, helping the poor, healing the sick. And by golly, we have done it. He might have fed 5,000 people from a handful of loaves of bread, and that is miraculous and amazing, but think about how much modern economics has fed so many billions more. 
He may have healed some hundred or something. I mean, you can depend on what version of the Bible and go through and count everyone up. Maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand. But modern medicine, which is a gift from God, inspired and brought forward by the advocate, has saved millions, if not billions of people. Think about it. Just go through this in your head for a second. If we were to have lived when Jesus lived, if you have high blood pressure pills, you are probably dead in 33 AD. If you are a diabetic, you would have died without modern medicine. If you have given birth, you had a 33% chance of dying each time in ancient times. If you wear glasses or corrective lenses, you would have been unemployable in ancient times. Most of us, and that's not all of it, wouldn't have made it in 33 AD. Or at least wouldn't have made it as long as we did. If you ever had cancer, you wouldn't have made it in 33 AD. These are all things that we've managed to fight, managed in some cases to win, managed to go ahead and defeat with the help of the Spirit through the gifts of science and reason and intuition and endeavors and, you know, on and on and on. We have fulfilled and continue to fulfill that prophecy that by faith, humanity may do even greater things. We stand and can look back and say, man, we sure did. And we should continue to do in faith. See, today is a beautiful, amazing, it's one of my favorite parts of the Bible. Because it's this wonderful and beautiful reminder of not just what God did, but God does in in providing us a home and a place to finally land but then reminds us that that is not the goal of Christianity, that the goal is that by knowing the Spirit, by knowing the Father, by knowing the Son, we can go out and do greater works than even what we read in the Bible. We can feed more people, heal more people, love more people, save more people, because that's what God calls us to do. But as you go out today, ask yourself a simple question. How is God calling me to be a blessing to the world just like Christ has been a blessing to me?